Hello Internet, Seth Gorkowski, and today we'll be taking a tour of the Octung Cthulhu Quick Start Rules, published in 2020 by Modiphius Entertainment. For those not familiar with Octung Cthulhu, it's a World War II themed tabletop RPG focusing on the secret war between the various sides, such as Britain's Section M or Black Sun, the occult Nazi faction, much like you'd find in Indiana Jones or maybe Hydra from the Captain America movie. Its main themes are horror and pulpy action. The first edition of the game was originally published in 2013 and was compatible with Call of Cthulhu 6th edition and with Savage Worlds. This is for the new second edition of the game, which is two books. The Player's Guide, that has all the combat rules and character creation information, basically all the rules a player would need, and the Game Master's Guide, which is all the world lore and the monster stats and all that stuff. There's also a special Black Sun edition, a leatherette book with gold trimmings that combines both the player and the Game Master Guide in one extremely beautiful book. Now, for the sake of full disclosure, Modiphius sent me a copy of the Black Sun edition for review purposes. I said that they appreciated my reviews, even though I might have been a little critical of parts, and that they knew I was a Cthulhu fan, so they wanted to see if maybe I'd want to give this system a spin and see if I liked the improvements that they had made. So a huge thank you to them. This book is incredibly beautiful. Pictures do not give it justice. Now one thing that I've always said about Modiphius is that they have always excelled at beautiful presentation and beautiful art, and this Black Sun book is one of the most gorgeous RPG books that I've ever seen. Unfortunately, my first criticism of it is that even inside this stunning 458-page rulebook, there isn't a sample adventure. I mean, what the heck, guys? I mean, you remember to include one in both Conan and Star Trek, so why not here? Well, that's where the quick start rules come in. The book is 44 pages and includes both a condensed set of game rules as well as a 16-page adventure, a quick trip to France, that helps game masters walk through the rules of how to run this game, and then five pre-generated characters for the players to use. So what we're going to do is review the quick start rules. Now, originally I had planned on making this video covering both the rules and the adventure all in one video, much like I did for my original uh, review for Conan's Pit of Catalo. However, once I started gathering all my thoughts and writing it out, it quickly became clear that this was going to be a monster video if I tried to do that. So instead, what I'm going to do is what I did for Alien and for Cyberpunk Red Darter sets and break it into two videos. Uh, one is the rules walkthrough, which is this one, and the other is going to be about the adventure itself. The Quick Start book is totally free on DriveThruRPG as a PDF. I have a link below if you want to pick it up and try it out, or just simply follow along with me. The second edition of Octung Cthulhu uses Modiphius' house system, the 2D20 system mechanic. Now, I've played 2D20 before with uh, Conan and Adventures in an Age Undreamed of, and I have several reviews as well, as well as a full system review that I've done for that, and if you might recall, I really wasn't the biggest fan of it. I had a lot of criticisms and a lot of praises, but I never got fully comfortable with running it. My players, on the other hand, they loved it. Or as we've come to realize, loved it whenever we weren't in the actual act of playing it. Between the sessions, we loved it. Couldn't get enough of it. During the sessions, eh, different story. Octon Cthulhu uses the same rules engine, but with several changes and improvements made to it, which is why Modiphius sent me the rulebook, to see if uh, maybe this update might win me over. Now, when I reviewed Conan, I described the 2D20 system as writing a razor's edge between intuitively simple and dauntingly complex. And even with the changes that they made for Octon Cthulhu, I still feel that way. Hey, and I'm Jack the NPC, anachronistic soldier and amateur occultist. I'm here to give it to you from a player's side of things as we get to combine two of my favorite bad guys, Nazis and Lovecraftian whores, and the best way of shooting them. Seriously, this game is a lot like that opening scene in Hellboy. What a great film. Del Toro is an absolute treasure. Or kind of like that movie Overlord, just, you know, not as sucky. I don't even know how they were able to make that movie suck so bad, but J.J.? Yeah, he managed to pull it off. So let's talk about the quick start rule, starting with what do you need to play Octon Cthulhu? Okay, aside from just the quick start rules, paper, pencils, you're gonna need some dice. 
The 2D20 system uses only two types of dice. Uh, your standard D20, which you're going to want somewhere between uh, two and five of those, and then some six-sided dice, which you're probably going to want uh, five to six of those in order to play it. D6, which are referred to as challenge dice in the game, uh, and they're not called D6 or CD or anything like that inside the book. Instead, whenever you find them referenced, they're denoted with this little Cthulhu symbol here, which is like what they did with Conan and the Phoenix symbol. And again, I don't know why Modiphius does this. I'm not a fan of it. So if you look inside the rules pages for listed damage, for weapon stats, or anywhere that they refer to a D6, it's denoted with this little squid symbol, such as uh, Thompson's submachine gun does five squids. And I find it personally annoying because whenever you're trying to write this out on a character sheet or a cheat sheet or something like that, you know, I don't know where the squiddy is on my keyboard in order to type that. So I wish they just simply referred to it as CD or D6 because the symbol replacement just simply feels like they're trying to be different for different sake, I don't feel that it does any sort of improvement. Now, Modiphius does sell a special Octung Cthulhu dice set, two different colors of them. Now, they're not necessary in order to play it. You can simply use regular D6 instead of these special ones if you want to. It's not going to hinder you at all. Modiphius sent me a set of these, and I do find them nice and a lot easier to use than regular D6 because I don't have to convert the numbers. I also prefer them over the Conan 2D20 dice that I already owned. I just find them a lot cleaner, but they're not as as nice as the custom challenge dice that my buddy George made for us. Next, you're going to need several tokens that serve as your fortune, momentum, and threat counters. Now, these can be anything. Uh, poker chips, beads, coins, playing cards, whatever it is that you like. You're probably going to want six momentum tokens for each player, as well as six threat tokens. And you're probably going to want to have a pair of bowls, you know, one for momentum and one for threat. Fortune, you don't actually need fortune tokens, but I find them handy, so you're going to want, you know, four to five of those per player. Now, once we have our dice and everything, let's talk about how to use them. The base mechanics is done through skill tests, and that's for everything. Charming a guard, shooting a gun, casting a spell, it's all skill tests. Now, how we do that is we roll a certain number of 20-sided dice. It usually starts off with two 20-sided dice, and we try to roll between a target number, and then we count the number of successes that we rolled. So let's say that this is our character here, and they wish to make a tactics check using their tactics skill, which they have a four in. So we then add that to an appropriate stat. So we'll go with reason for this, which is 10. So 10 plus 4 comes to 14. That's our target number. Every d20 that results in a 14 or less counts as a success. If a die result comes up with a 1, that counts as two successes. Now let's talk about focuses. Every skill has subcategories underneath it, like specializations. And if we have a focus in that particular way in which we're wanting to use this skill, then we get to have a potential to have more successes with it. So let's say that the tactics skill that we're doing is we're attempting to do a battle plan for troops, and that falls into army tactics, which we do have a focus in. And because our skill has an appropriate focus for this test, uh, any d20s that result in our skill level or lower count as two successes. So in this case, because the skill is four, any d20s that roll a four or less count as two successes, uh, while anything that still hits our target number of 14 or less counts as one success, and anything that's 15 or higher doesn't count as a success at all. If a character lacks focus in any particular skill, such as uh, we're attempting naval tactics instead of army tactics here, or in the case of fighting, we have a focus on handgun, but we're wanting to shoot our submachine gun, then we only get the double successes if we rolled a 1. Most skill tests are performed by rolling two 20-sided dice, so that means any skill check could result in between you know, no successes, meaning that we rolled above the target number on all our dice, or maybe we get four successes, meaning that we got both dice, they rolled low enough to count as two successes, so anywhere between zero and four successes. We can also roll more than just two 20-sided dice for a skill test. We can actually roll up to five 20-sided dice for a skill test under certain conditions. We'll get to how we can do that, uh, you know, we'll be having more than two 20 siders at a skill check at a time, but just to let you know that yes, it can be done, you might be able to roll more than two 20 sided dice in order to achieve a test. Next, we total up the number of successes and compare that to the task difficulty, which was set by the game master. Difficulty levels can range between zero, which means it's routine, up to five, which means it's near impossible to do. Now, most tests are going to be done at difficulty one, meaning that we only need to roll a single success in order to pass this skill check. In the case of a post skill test, such as you're trying to sneak past a guard, it would be your stealth skill versus the guard's observation skill, and whoever rolled the most number of successes wins. In the event of a tie of an opposed test, a victory goes to the attacker, which is 
kind of weird to, compared to how other games do that, where it would go to the attacker instead of the defender, but um, okay, yeah, I can roll with that. Now, if you roll more successes than you need in order to pass a skill check, such as uh, you only needed one success, but you rolled three successes, those extra successes become what's called momentum. So again, if you only needed one and you rolled three, that now means uh, two of those successes have turned into momentum. Momentum is my favorite of the 2D20 mechanics, and characters can spend their momentum on various things. There's also additional momentum spins for combat actions as well as for magic. So a character can spin their momentum to reduce the time a task took to succeed, such as repairing an engine in minutes versus hours, or obtain additional information from an observation test or an interrogation, or they might use it to purchase additional d20s on their next skill test, meaning that we can you know, now have three or four or five d20s whenever we do our next check, just depending on how much momentum we spent on that. In combat, we could use momentum to increase the number of challenge dice that we roll for damage or disarm an opponent, meaning that our attack you know, knocked the weapon out of their hands, or maybe we subject a secondary opponent to weapon damage as well, there's a lot of cool stuff that momentum can buy. Now, if a player chooses not to spend all of their momentum, it can be saved in a group pool, meaning that a player might build up a bunch of momentum through you know, a lot of extra successes, then place those in a pool, and then one of the next players can then you know, pick those momentum up and use those to purchase things like you know, extra d20 or other benefits like that. Now, the pool can never go higher than six, so you know, if you've got seven momentum, you're going to need to spend one or lose it because you can only put six in the pool, and the pool you know, it, it can't have six from this person, six from this person, it's just six total. So anything above that is lost, and at the end of each scene or in each combat round, whatever momentum is left in the pool yeah, it goes away. So it's going to slowly go down as time goes, so hopefully the players will use it and it'll keep refreshing, because on a long enough time scale, either six scenes or six combat rounds, it would drop down to zero. The momentum pool is a fantastic tool to promote play a teamwork, really encouraging them to work together. So you can have it where one player chooses to go go first and attempt some skill that they're really good at just so they can build up that momentum and pass that off to another player down the line that's got a really important or really difficult skill check that they got to make. Game Masters have their own action currency as well, which is called Threat, which they can spend to increase the challenges for the player characters. Game Masters begin the game with two Threat per player. They can also build their pool in the same manner that players can, like it's with momentum, though it doesn't have a maximum limit that it can have on Threat. Or if a player wishes to use a momentum spend, but they lack the momentum in order to purchase that spend to do it, uh, they can purchase momentum spends on a one-to-one -one ratio of threat. So essentially giving the game master more threat to challenge them with later in order to get some momentum now. Now, some situations where you might have you know, powerful villains, you know, they might naturally increase the game master's threat just by you know, showing up, just their presence is that threatening. Like Great Cthulhu himself is worth 12 threat if he was to walk on the table. Game Masters can spend from their threat pool in several ways. Uh, they can use it in the same way that players can with the momentum, or they can use it to summon bad guy reinforcements, or alter some aspect of the environment, such as you know, bad weather descends upon them, and you know, making skills more difficult because it's harder to see or it's harder to drive. It is a really cool mechanic. Oh yeah, critics of this system like to say that it encourages antagonistic game masters, giving them free reign to make the game more difficult and tormenting their players however they like. But we disagree with that. An antagonistic game master is going to be an antagonistic game master no matter what game it is that they're playing. But this system at least helps rein them in by forcing them to pay for all those obstacles and difficulties out of a finite pool versus just giving them a blank check to do whatever they want, whatever they want. So really, this is a checks and balance system. Threat, and its equivalent in the other 2D20 games, forces a game master to contemplate and purchase things that they normally wouldn't. In other games, if I wanted to inject a little bit more action, I might have a few bad guys come bursting in through the door, add some setbacks in order to raise the stakes on the players. But with this system, a game master has to pay for that out of a pool, making them have to weigh if they really want to do that now or save their threat for later on in the game, like a big climax at the very end, rather than just doing it every single time that the mood strikes them. 
or if a player suffers some sort of complication, and we'll get to those shortly, if a game master doesn't want to give further complications to what's already a bad situation going on, or they can't come up with an appropriate one for that moment, the game master can simply convert that to threat and save that for later in order to use that at a later time. So let's talk about complications. When a player or a game master is rolling their skill test, if one or more of those dice comes up with a 20, then that means that a complication has occurred. Complications do not mean failure. A player could roll their 2d20, have one die come up as a success, but another come up as a complication, meaning that they did succeed at whatever it is they were trying to do, but they also suffered a setback or some sort of inconvenient truth as well. An example of this might be that they're leaping out to a catwalk, a broken catwalk, but they miss it, now they're hanging off the edge, or uh, maybe they drop their weapon or something in the process, or maybe you did successfully shoot the bad guy, but now your ammo is spent, you're going to have to reload. If a player rolls a complication, the game master might simply add two points to their threat pool and save that for later. If a game master rolls a complication, uh, they can either choose to allow the complication or spend two threat from their threat pool in order to ignore it. And if a player to is totally successful in a test and a game master, they can still spend two threat to add a complication to a successful skill check, you know, just to kind of liven things up a bit. Or if a player fails a skill test, but the game master really doesn't want them to fail that, they can have their character succeed, but with a cost of an additional complication. You know, essentially some skill checks, you know, they aren't about the character succeeding it, but more about how well they succeed at it, or at what cost do they succeed at it. Fortune is another tool that players have at their disposal. Each player begins the game with three fortune points. Once per scene, a player can cash one of those points in for some sort of extraordinary benefit, such as re-rolling some dice, getting a second major action in a combat round, or having an automatic critical success on the die roll. Fortune can also be spent to add a new truth to the scene. You know, added something there that wasn't there before. Such as now, there's a chandelier that's up on that ceiling over there, and if I cut that rope right there, it'll drop that chandelier onto those bad guys and ruin their day. Or maybe now there's a telephone in that guard shack over there, and that phone rings and the guard picks it up, which gives me a plus in order to sneak past that guard and do whatever it is I gotta do. Now, game masters, of course, they get to approve whatever it is that a player wants to add to a scene, but this makes Fortune a powerful tool that players can use. Game masters can and should be awarding players additional Fortune points for uh, achieving a major goal, coming up with a great plan, maybe great role player, whatever it is that the game master deems appropriate. However, a player can never have more than five Fortune points at any time, and you know, anything that they earn beyond that is lost, so it's kind of use them or lose them. Okay, so that's the basics of skill tests. Now, I do have a a couple criticisms here. First, skill checks and attributes are separate, and the game master determines which attribute works for whatever skill test that a player is trying to achieve, and a player might be able to negotiate certain ones, such as uh, using insight or reason for a particular task. And I have no problem with skills and attributes being separate, where you know uh, this skill doesn't always use the same attribute, you get to choose which attribute you're putting with it. Uh, Traveler, a game that I love and I've written for, they do the exact same thing. However, with the quick start rules, it doesn't offer much in the ways of examples of what attributes work best for certain tasks that a player might try to do, uh, such as the suggested defaults for what you would use for certain actions, which is one thing that other games do provide as just kind of a, a set kind of list of kind of defaults or suggestions. And then the game master can see that and they can kind of weigh if that's how they want to do it for this case or make exceptions or any judgment calls off of that, but it at least gives them a good starting point. Now, normally at this point in the review, I would say, well, this is just some quick start rules and you know I'm sure that the expanded and full rule book does give us some examples of you know how to approach that the attribute and skill combinations but I do have the full rule book and it doesn't give any of that it really keeps it vague here uh, now maybe they chose to give very few examples as a way not to accidentally limit a game master by committing them that you know this is the only way to do it but the result makes it feel just a bit directionless here because the game master they really don't have kind of a, a another opinion of how they should do that that. And a game master and a player, they don't have a foundation if they're doing it correctly. And for us, at least, it kind of leaves this kind of question of, you know, am, am I doing this right? And as I've mentioned in previous videos, Modiphius is terrible at giving examples. So we've got a lot of rules here, but very little help in using them or, you know, helping the players and the game master judge if they're using them properly, which opens the door to a lot of confusion and a lot of wondering if you're doing it correctly at all. And also opens the door for that certain kind of player who might want to take 
take advantage of an uncertain Game Master who has no examples to support whatever it is that the Game Master wants to do. Next, let's talk about Truths. We discussed those when discussing Fortune Points before, but there's a lot more that can be done with these. Truths are little facts that can change effects within the game. So while players can introduce Truths with their Fortune, they can also spend two momentum for whatever action it was that they were successful at, and we kind of make a small change to something going around them. So, such as when I shot the guard in the guard shack, around, you know, struck the electric box in the wall behind him, and now the lights are turned off. Truths increase or decrease the difficulty of something by one step or they might make some action impossible or possible at all. Now, based off of this description, I think I understand it pretty well. They really don't explain it that much in the quick start rules. I mean, this is literally all the description they gave it. So I checked the players in the Game Master's Guide to see if might, there might be a little bit more about there, but not much, you know, to help players determine what's appropriate for them to do. However, and this is where it gets confusing for me, is in the sample adventure, A Quick Trip to France, and this isn't a spoiler, really, this is from the very opening of the opening scene, the characters are to parachute from a plane. Now, one of the characters is described as being a veteran commando. So the adventure suggests that because he's an experienced commando, that the difficulty be reduced by one, making it a difficulty zero task for him to do this. Now, the player, they don't spend any momentum or fortune points on this. They just get this because this is a truth about the character. And I find it kind of weird. I mean, this character, they don't even have the athletic skill at all. And because he's described as just being a veteran commando, Commando, does that now mean we can apply this to everything else that a commando does? You know, shooting, sneaking, survival. Uh, all of those are supposed to be easier as well by the same argument that, well, he's a veteran commando. And even if he has no actual skill rank in the field it is that we're trying to give him this bonus to. In the Game Master's Guide where they discuss truths, they bring up the same character, saying that his truths were a result of a detailed backstory rather than any of the game's normal means of rolling backgrounds or characteristics. So the player making this character chose to give this to himself as a personal truth, and evidently they can do that just to turn the game on easy mode. Truths I feel are poorly explained. On the surface it seems easy enough, but then once we get to the Quick Start's own adventure's pre presentation on how to employ them, it threw me for a loop there. And then when I ran my players through the adventure and I explained this character's truth and how we were going to use it, most of them were actually turned off by that. Yeah, because it's basically legalized cheating. I mean, I get the method where a player spins some momentum after the successful skill check, and they're able to use that to introduce a new truth. You know, some sort of plus for them or a minus for the bad guy as a result of whatever the successful skill check was. That makes sense. I like it. I love it. It's great. There's also fortune spins, where a player can spend a fortune point to introduce some sort of new aspect to the narrative. But that's also got a cost involved that they gotta spend a fortune point to do it, and they're limited in the sense that they can only spend one fortune point per scene. So that keeps everything in check. But then the rules go on to give this example of this commando captain and how we should just interpret whatever his truths are. That really didn't sit well with us because it feels like we're trying to get away with something with it. So even though we get to benefit from whatever that is, it just wasn't anything that we were comfortable with. Next is combat. Action scenes are broken up into rounds. Each character gets one major action, such as a full sprint or making an attack. They also get one minor action, such as drawing a weapon or making a short movement or taking aim. Unless there's an in-game reason for it not to, action order begins with a player character, and it's determined by the game master however they want. Then after that player character goes, the action order goes back and forth between the PCs and NPCs until all the characters have had a turn, and then we start up with the next round. Make Making an attack is a fighting skill plus the appropriate attribute for that. Firearms hit if this roll is successful, while melee fighting is subject to an opposed roll from a defender. If an attack hits, the player rolls however many challenge dice, the weapon, and any appropriate bonuses that they have give. So this suppressed stun gun here does three squiddies of damage. Challenge dice, if rolled with regular d6, have these values. 1 and 2 are equal to 1 and 2 damage. 3 and 4 are worth nothing. Zero damage. 5 and 6 are worth 1 point each, but each of those activate an effect if the weapon has one. Some weapons have special effects, such as this fighting knife here has piercing, and if effect is rolled, then the piercing effect activates. So in this case, piercing ignores one point of armor for each effect rolled. So if I roll my dice and I get two effects, then I ignore two points of armor. 
Ranged weapons, whether bows or pistols or machine guns, we don't count individual bullets for those. Each ranged weapon has three ammo. Now, if a player rolls a complication on an attack, it might mean that they spent one of those three ammo. Or the player might choose to open up and perform what's called a salvo, which means they're going all out and they're spraying a ton of shots at their enemy. Performing a salvo costs one ammo. The salvos might also have additional effects, such as this infield revolver has the effect of vicious when performing a salvo with it. Weapons also have qualities listed here, such as the Sten gun is both subtle and inaccurate. Unfortunately, the Quick Start rules give no explanation of weapon qualities at all. Nothing. It lists them right here. This is from one of the pre-gen character sheets, but the rules don't say what any of this means. Now, thankfully, I do happen to have the full rule book and could look up what weapon qualities mean. But anyone who's simply using the Quick Start rules, I guess they're just out of luck here, so I don't even know why they put the weapon qualities in the Quick Start guide if they weren't even going to explain what the weapon qualities were in the first place. It leads to confusion because now they're going to be flipping through the Quick Start guide trying to figure out what those words mean. Once damage is calculated, and that's referred to stress in this game, we subtract any points that were soaked up by armor, so we have armor for physical damage and courage is our mental armor, we then note it here. Stress, whether mental or physical, is all tracked out of the same pool, and however much stress we can handle is dependent on whatever our stats are. I suggest that players track them in a way such as uh, physical stress, you mark that with an X, and mental stress, you mark with a slash, or you know, just do it however you like, but I do suggest that you mark those differently so you know how much stress came from what source. Now, stress is not permanent. It refreshes at the beginning of the next scene. So if your character's in a battle and they've got nine stress on their sheet once the battle's over, once that's you know, finished and they move on to the next scene, their stress tracker drops back down to zero. However, once their stress tracker is full, or if they receive five stress or more from any single attack, we take a wound. If it's a mental wound, if they took mental damage that caused it, physical wound, if physical damage caused it, each wound increases a character's chances of complication by one step. So one wound, you'd suffer a complication on both a 19 and 20, two wounds, you get it through 18 through 20, and once a character has three wounds, they're considered defeated and can no longer act. And if they have two or more physical wounds once they hit three, they also must make death saves every round or die. All in all, I dig this mechanic and this damage system. It gives us both the aspects of you know, you know, damage being temporary fatigue, but also being physical actual damage that gives them complications and makes them suffer because they're hurt. So it's both cinematic and larger than life. You know, their, their heroes, they're able to kind of shrug off damage and just keep going, while also being perilous, like you'd have in you know, other games like uh, Call of Cthulhu or uh, Cyberpunk or something, where you're, you know, you're damaged, you don't really actually have that many real hit points. And it's a far simpler version than they had in Conan, so overall, I really do like this damage system. Now let's get to zones. Zones are how we determine range and distance. Instead of physical distance, zones are more nebulous, such as behind the control panel or in the corridor, rather than just saying 60 feet away. There are four zone ranges. Close, being the zone that you're in, medium, which is one zone away from you, then long and extreme. And then there's also the state of reach, which is uh, something that means that you're in close range with them, but you're also close enough to touch them. Now, Modiphius really goes out of their way never to specify zone parameters here, but uh, in searching the full player's handbook in a section under communication, it does specify there that close range is with uh, enough range to be heard and understood without having to raise your voice. So I guess that's like, what, like 30, 40 feet? Now, when I reviewed Conan, I expressed an intense dislike for how their zone mechanics worked. And when reading it, it makes sense. But in a game, it just never worked for us. And we've got the same problem when we tried Octung Cthulhu. Probably one of the easiest tools that Modiphius could use to illustrate zones and you know, help me and any other game masters or players understand it would simply be showing a map with the zones marked out on it. You know, show it to us. But they don't do that. I've never seen a map like that among any of the stuff that I've read. Uh, we might have a map that's provided, but there's no zones marked on it or described as where they are. Or we might have zones described to us, but no map to see what that looks like. So let's look at weapon ranges. And this list here comes from the player's guide. It lists their range and zones. So we can see here that an M1 Garand, a real weapon with a range of 500 yards, is listed as being medium range. While a longbow, a weapon that's got an effective range of 350 yards, is listed as being long range. Closer comparison, both weapons have three ammo, do five dice in damage, and are size major, have the vicious effect on salvos, and are reliable. However, the longbow, in addition to uh, having longer range, also has the piercing effect and the subtle quality, meaning that in the world of Octung Cthulhu, 
The longbow is superior to a rifle. Evidently, Mad Jack was right all along. Who? Mad Jack Churchill, the dude that was famous for fighting the Second World War with a longbow and a freaking sword. Dude was a crazy badass. But evidently, he was crazy like a fox, because he was the only guy in the entire war that actually read the rulebook, and he knew that a longbow was superior to a rifle in every single way. Well, not quite in every way. While this is not mentioned in the quick start rules, one of the things that does appear in the full rule book is that in order to hit a target with a ranged weapon, the difficulty increases by one for every zone increment that it is from its standard range. So if we have a weapon that's got long range that has a harder time hitting something that's at medium or at close range. Regardless, I don't like the 2d20 zone mechanics. Uh, maybe they just better define them by giving them a, a maximum size like Alien did. I really dig Alien zone mechanics or provided us with a map with the zones marked out on it so I could kind of visualize it and see what they're talking about, or just better defined as to what sets uh, zone parameters. That way it's clear and it's not just bringing up things that should simply count as cover or terrain that would impede a person's movement to that zone, but was it going to do anything to slow down a bullet or an arrow? I've used zones in other game systems with no problems at all, but the 2D20 zone mechanic, it just doesn't work for me. Now some defenders of the 2D20 zone mechanics, you know, they say how this game is meant to be you know, theater of the mind, and you know, not to be meant to be a strategic game with miniatures or other wargaming thing like distances or anything like that. And that argument would work, except for when inside the Aunt Tung Cthulhu rule book, it then advertises their miniature lines that they sell. So clearly, Modifius supports the use of miniatures and maps because they have a selection of minis to sell you right there on their website. Finally, let's look at magic. Magic in Aunt Tung Cthulhu is pretty simple. Uh, the quick guide gives us two spellcaster PCs as well as some NPCs that we can use. Individual spells are treated like skill tests. You know, battlefield spells can be cast inside of a combat round, while ritual spells, you know, they take longer and they have to accrue a, a certain number of points before they take effect, meaning that casting a ritual spell can take several rounds. Casting a spell also inflicts mental stress on the caster, so it's not going to be something that they're going to be doing every single round because, you know, it's going to be damaging them after a while. And one thing I really do like is that spellcasters have a reaction that they can do any round where they can do a counter spell against another caster, you know, where they get a chance to weaken or disrupt any spells that they're trying to do. I really dig the magic rules of this game. I find it much easier to use than the Conan's magic system. I do feel that that was a really good change that they made in order to streamline the 2D20 for this particular game. Overall though, after reading it and playing the adventure, I'm just not sold on this game. I love the setting, I love the concepts, the books and the art are absolutely beautiful, but the rules, they're just not my jam, and my players had the same reaction. We really wanted to like this one. We thought we had all the rules down before we started, and we were excited to play. But then once we got going in-game, those mechanics just didn't work that well for us, and all the problems that we had with Conan 2D20 came well and right back up. And if nothing else, this really convinced us that while we might like the idea or the theory of 2D20, we really don't like the actuality of what is 2D20. It's just not a thing. I feel that the biggest problem with the system is that it's trying too hard to be both rules heavy and high crunch while also being a rules light narrative focused game. And I feel that they really should have just chosen one or the other. And if they had done that, it would work perfectly well. But this combination of you know, really complicated aspects mixed with vaguely defined loose aspects, it just doesn't work for me. Now, some people really do love this system and it works great for them. That's great. Everybody's different. Now, maybe if I had only had the quick start rules, I might be convinced to at least, you know, pick up a copy of the core book to see if my issues were resolved once we got to the full rules and, you know, see if, you know, my questions were answered there. But because I already had the full core rule book, I could see that, no, those issues weren't answered there. So I'm just going to move on to a different system, one that works better for me and one that works better for my players. However, that is just us. If the system does intrigue you, the quick start rules are totally free. It doesn't cost you anything to pick them up, look at them, and try them out. So by all means, you know, definitely do pick them up. I stuck a link down below. Uh, check it out, and if you see that this is a system that you enjoy and it's something that works for you and your players, then you can then go further and pick up the full rules having made an educated decision. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. Until next time, heroes, you have a great day. You know, 
You completely neglected to mention that you have written World War II military horror. With your Valdekin story, The Raid on Wiefelsberg, it has got everything that this game has. You've got evil Nazis. You've got monsters. You've got monster hunters and magic weapons. You've even got that creepy gold Nazi cauldron that they fished out of a Bavarian lake a few years back. And you completely neglected mentioning any of that stuff. You are terrible at self-promotion.